be I should be ro uh, recording this. Where's my reminder? Um, so 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 I've I've kind of jumped the gun with with these uh, curves and already have uh, modeled out. Let me make this nicer Arctic, and I have modeled out the site uh, for you from them. So just so that we uh, can save some time. Um, and, and, and the site quality is okay if you're looking at it from further away. But if you zoom in, it's, you know, it's not that great. There are, there's a few errors here and there, but that's fine. Uh, it's something we can, we can work with. Um, to quickly show you how I model out this kind of a site, or not model out, I guess, I'm using Grasshopper for that. You know, how I create this kind of a site from uh, just the curves, I can can quickly show you. Um, let me, and, and you don't need to follow this. Uh, this is just, you know, this is just going to be a quick one. Let me just actually, or I'll, I'll show you the whole thing. Okay, so, uh, I go to Grasshopper, let me load that up. While it's loading, in regards to the method that you choose to, to, to make your building, there's no correct method, meaning that the sooner you choose it, the more time you will have to polish it. And the better it's polished, the more you work on it, the better it's going to become, right? So the, the, the starting point doesn't really matter that much. Just choose one of the methods that you prefer. If you're not sure, then you can just choose the, um, wait, let me open up the chat. Uh, how do you open the file in Rhino? Ah, yes. Uh, right click on the file, choose to unzip or unpack or unarchive. Um, I, 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 I don't know how it's, how it's called in Swedish. And then you, then you'll have the, 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 no, you, you, you you don't need a RAR reader. Uh, Windows by itself. Um, Windows Windows should have it without the WinRAR. Unless you're running a Mac, then with a Mac you might need to. That's strange. Anyway, uh, if, if you need it, uh, you can just get the, for Windows, you can get WinRAR. Um, this one, um, it's free. It says buy, but if you just go to download, you can just download download it and it's fine. The 64 bit, by the way, uh, for Mac, I have no idea. Uh, keep in mind that it's dot RAR files are industry standard in architecture for sending files from one. Um, let's say you're sending clients uh, files to a client. Uh, and the client is sending files back to you. Everyone is using .rar or .zip, but uh, you know, get used to this. Okay, so I'll just uh, continue talking re re real fast about the the assignment. Uh, where was I? 
um, yeah, so it's all about how much time you spend on the on the model. It doesn't matter uh, what kind of approach you have. If you're not sure about the approach, then just choose Rhino, right, and model it out. By the end of like next week or week after that, all of you will be using Rhino rather than Grasshopper for creating form. That's just simply because Grasshopper is useless when it um, when you need to actually uh, design the form, right? Then, then, then it's definitely straight up Rhino modeling that you need to use. Rhino is very useful when you need to either do experimental stuff or simulation-based stuff, or if you need to do repetitive tasks, such as, you know, I need to extrude this cylinder 20 times, you know, then you would just use, um, then you would just use Grasshopper for that. So after these workshops, we will be like 90% or even more uh, of, of your work is going to be done in Rhino rather than Grasshopper. But, and, and the more you work, the more you will know uh, how much, the more you'll know which program to choose for which task, right? Because, um, um, if, if, if you haven't worked with the programs uh, a lot yet, um, that, that, then you might think that, you know, I'll be using Grasshopper for the whole building from start to finish. And trust me, it's the worst idea you can ever have. That will never work. Or, I mean, it would work, but you would need to spend like five years on it and it wouldn't be a nice building by the end. Um, does everyone have the, the, the model open? Who still needs time? Mm -hmm. I assume everyone has it, okay. Okay, um, so I'll just, again, you don't need to do this part, but I'll just quickly show you how I've, I've created that landscape. Um, so all of these here, I've already cleaned them up. This is what you usually get from the municipality, right? Uh, you don't just get this, you also get um, the, the, the markups uh, for the height of, of the, let's see, text. Um, plus 168 point, uh, or this is Malmo, this is much more flat, so point 0.8.254, something like that. You know, so, so you get these kind of markups for every, uh, every ISO curve. So the first thing was that um, this, this drawing came in completely flat, and it only had those kind of... Uh, those kind of a text markups. So the first thing that I've done in Grasshopper was um, I've created this kind of recognition script where it recognizes what kind of a, what kind of text does each curve have attached to it. And according to that text, the curves were moved up. Uh, said that I, I've been doing it because, simply because there's so many curves and I didn't want to move all of them one by one. But if the landscape has much you know, le less curves, then I usually just straight up move them by hand, you know, uh, up to, to correct uh, altitudes. So by the end of, uh, of that, I, I got the curves at different heights. Um, and I'll... I won't be showing you the recognition, the text recognition script. First of all, it's very buggy. Second of all, unnecessary. Oh, this is something something funky here. Doesn't matter. 
Um, the next thing was that I needed to clean clean off all of the unnecessary curves, such as uh, building outlines, road outlines, piping, um, vegetation, and so on, because those also come in with with this kind of a drawing from the municipality. And basically, what what I'm left with is just different contour lines of the landscape at different uh, altitudes. Uh, where's the chat? Uh, the, the, the ISO curves and the text was in the same layer. Um, and I think for some reason the vegetation was in the same layer, but uh, the, the, the buildings and the piping and so on were in different layers. And usually they are. I mean, if they're not uh, in different layers, then someone in the municipality is not doing their job correctly because there are industry standards, you know, and, and naming conventions for, for these kind of layers, uh, which means that any drawing that you get from the municipality should be in separate layers, unless you're um, doing a, a reconstruction project and, and, and you're receiving plans, elevations, and sections of a historical building, then what you will get is a, either a, a, a um, PDF, you know, of a, of a pencil drawing, or even worse, a JPEG photo of, of, of a pencil drawing, which would mean that you would need to redraw the whole thing uh, from from reference, right? Okay, uh, back to here. So then I, I started thinking how, how to create a landscape from this. You know, you could start thinking about lofting, but that is not definitely not the case here because uh, the curves, some of the curves are these kind of islands, and some of the curves are are just straight up. Uh, line segments that go from one side of the, well, this one is not, yeah, there we go. Straight up line segments that go from one side of the uh, landscape uh, to the other, uh, which means that loft will not work. Um, the only thing that might work is patch, but in Rhino, but patch would just straight up crash. Um, this is way too much stuff for patch to take care of, especially considering that I'm running a laptop. So instead, I used Grasshopper for it. And by now, we all know that meshes, uh, creating a mesh is, is much, much faster, uh, computationally speaking, much, much faster than creating a surface. So I have uh, referenced in all of the curves into into grasshopper and i've used a, a, um, a tool that's called the deloni delonoi i don't know how to pronounce that but delonoi mesh so i've used that one uh, but this one asks us for points and uh, plane and these are curves right uh, so which means that i can't just connect curves to points and you know hope for the best Instead, I need to extract all of the points where the curves change direction. And those points can be extracted with discontinuities. Discontinuity. Again, you don't need to do this part. And as you can see, now when I plug in discontinuity, like it takes a while. It takes a while to calculate and it takes a while to show. That's just simply because I have a lot of points now. Right, so let me hide them just so that they're not in the way. And basically then I just connect the points to the Delonoi mesh, but notice how, um, where is my data tree? Notice how it says data with 2,609 branches. That means that all of the points that were, all of the corner points that were created are separated into separate lists according to which curve do they belong to. Meaning that I could just right click on the P output 
and I can choose to flatten and wait for it to do its, its job. And now I can see that I have data, like only one list of points. And I have uh, 1,212,624 points from which I can try and construct a mesh. So I'll, I'll just plug it in. And now we wait. I don't remember how long it takes. I might need to uh, cancel this operation or not, we will see. But usually, you know, it's, it's more than a million points and it's creating a geometry through those points, um, which means that in, in Rhino, if we were, were to use patch, that's definitely not, you know, not going to happen, not at all. Uh, here, we still have a fighting chance, but again, I don't really remember. Oh, there we go. Okay, so it wasn't that bad. Let me just check. Um, profiler, 48 seconds to, to, to calculate the mesh. That's, that's not, not bad. And from it, I have my Delonoi mesh which I can bake out. Yeah, and it's an invalid object. We don't care. Um, I will fix it in a bit. It's just some, some vertices are on top of each other and so on. The main thing is that this mesh, eh, Jesus Christ, it's so heavy. Trying to move it. Arctic, there we go. So that's our mesh that we have here. And then I would run it through um, different uh, tools and let me just delete that so that it stops lagging. I would run it through different tools in Rhino, uh, such as uh, mesh repair Mesh repair, I would use check mesh, then repair mesh, then kind of come back and see if there are any duplicate points. I would use align mesh vertices for it and, and, and stuff like that to, to, to make it work. But we already have it working. Show right here. And oh yeah, and I've added a few more things here and there. It's... Um, I've added this, this border around it and kind of made it into, in, into this kind of closed box. And this is for um, the previous year when we were CNC milling out, like using CNC milling wood. when we were CNC milling, milling it out, um, you need a closed, uh, you, you need closed geometry to, to be able to run this tool. By the way, the school does have a CNC mill, um, the, the, the um, our, our architecture school does have the CNC mill in the wood workshop and you can indeed use it for, you know, creating things like these. Not just like like these, but the the, the landscape itself can, can be created um, back here. So that's why I, I close it off. And now on to the actual tutorial. So I will be hiding the curves for now. I don't need those. I'll be just working with the mesh. So um, this. Since it's a mesh, and let me change its layer to this. So I've just changed the layer to, 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 the, to the mesh layer of it. Since this is a mesh, uh, Boolean operations and 
cutting, trimming, and, and manipulating it is a little bit rough, a little bit hard to do. Um, there are indeed mesh boolean and mesh um, trim uh, functions in, or, or commands in Rhino, but it's still not, uh, not that great. It, it, it doesn't work as cleanly as uh, polysurface tools. So instead, what, uh, what I want to do is I want to create a part of this uh, landscape. I want to create a part of it and rebuild it as a NURBS uh, surface. So to do that, I will go to the top view. Oh yeah, yes, 40 minutes. I'll go to the top view and somewhere near it, I will draw out a rectangle that is going to be 200 by 200 by 200. 200. So 200 by 200 uh, meters in length. By the way, meters, because here in the bottom you can see that the units are set to be meters. All right. So that's 200 by 200. That is more than enough space to place your building and, and, and kind of see a lot of surroundings. Let's say your building is something like uh, 30 by 30, you know, 900 square meters, uh, which is huge. Right, so, so let's say your building is uh, 900 square meters, that this is how big it would be in the overall uh, border of 200 by 200 meters. So this is more than, uh, this area is more than enough for modeling your, um, for, for, for using the, a portion of the landscape to, to, to incorporate it into your building design. And then I will use this, um, rectangle and by the way it does need to be either a square or some some form of a rectangle and i definitely suggest 200 by 200 a square of 200 by 200 and i will just move my rectangle on top of some part of 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 the landscape uh, and and basically the part which i want uh, which i will want to use as my Wait, I'm, I'm having a stroke. Um, <laughs> as, as the base of my uh, of of my building, so let's uh, I don't know I, I I'll just choose this one. Whatever, this one seems fine. I'll just in perspective view I'll just get that curve and just kind of move it up a little bit above the the landscape, something like so. All right, so it's floating above my landscape. Then, by the way, does, does everyone follow? Who needs time? I assume everyone's fine. Okay, let's move on. Uh, so then, um, actually let's start doing it and I will show you why we will need to delete these two polygons uh, at the base of, of, of our building, uh, not building, of, of our landscape. So first things first, run Grasshopper, load up Grasshopper, and reference in this rectangle into Grasshopper as a curve. Curve, right click, set one curve, that's our rectangle. Easy. And now I want to create a grid on top of my rectangle. And actually, let me look at it from top. Right, so I have my curve here. For now, I can hide the landscape. I have my curve here, 
and I just want to create a grid inside of it. And we have been doing that for quite a few times now. That is just, as long as the rectangle is flat, we can use divide, divide surface. As long as it's flat, divide surface will work. If it's not flat, it will just give us an error. Uh, it will turn red. So I know for a fact that this rectangle is flat. So divide surface, I just connect my curve as a surface input, and you can see that it's flat. And now I can create a grid uh, in it. So I'll, I'll just be choosing um, some sort of a grid sp spacing, not spacing, but how many points I have in X and Y direction in my, in my grid. And for now, I'll be choosing some sort of a smaller number, so something like 20, just a slider with 20. And I'll be just connecting it to the U input and also the V input. Something like this. Not a lot of resolution, but for testing purposes, this is going to be A-OK. -okay. So surface divide, UV 20. All right. Um, I want all of my points that are created here to be in one list. And this is, you know, it will become second nature to you to be able uh, to, to be doing this. You always check what kind of output you get, right, from surface divide. In, and if I hover my mouse uh, over the P output, which is the point output, even by just hovering my mouse over it, I can see that well, this is definitely not one list. This is a bunch of lists, right? And I can also double check it with param viewer. Uh, if I just plug it in, I can see data with 21 branches. If I double click it, I can see that, whoa, this is not one list. I want it to be one list. So what do I do? I right click on the P output and choose flatten. And now, everything gets merged into a single list. So make sure that you do this, flatten the, 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 the P output of surface divide. <clears throat> so now all of these guys are in the, same, in the same list. The thing is that they are, you know, yeah, we have a flat rectangle, we divide it up into points, and we have you know, a flat grid of points. That doesn't help us re in rebuilding um, the surface right here, uh, or, or this, this landscape right here. So what I'm going to do is I will project these points onto this mesh straight down as if you know they, they just go down until they hit the mesh and once they hit it that you know they, they get projected so to do that i first need to um, reference in the mesh into grasshopper so i'll just choose my landscape i'll create a mesh container uh in in in, in grasshopper right click on it set one mesh and there we go. Now I have the mesh referenced in into Grasshopper. And I can hide it in Rhino. So just, I don't want it to be in the way. So I will just select it in, uh, in Rhino and type in hide. Right. So we have a mesh, we have a grid of points. We want to project the grid of points onto the mesh. So I'll just I'll use a tool that's called project. And let's see how many like we have a bunch of different variations of that tool. One is project an object onto a plane, that doesn't work. Project a curve onto a B-rep, that doesn't work. And then we have project point. Project a point onto a collection of shapes. Ooh. That is very, you know, that sounds like something that is definitely useful for us because we have points and we do indeed have a shape. So project point, I choose that. 
probably I need to do this. Just so that we don't have any additional. Oh, come on. Just so that we don't have any additional questions. So, um, where were we? Project point, right? Um, three inputs. First one is projection uh, point to uh, which we want to project, and that's our grid of points. So I just connect that straight up like so. Second one is wait. Can't see what's going on. Hmm. Trying to invite Maria. Okay. Okay. Um, so first one was uh, we have a grid of points and we project them. Uh, so so we, we, we connect point to point input. Second one is um, projection direction, right? So by default, if I hover over it, I can see that it's set to be zero, zero, minus one, meaning it's minus one in Z direction, which you know in layman's terms is down, right? So, so it's, it's projected it's going to project the points downwards, straight down, which is perfect for us and we don't need to change anything about it. And the third one is geometry to project onto, and that is going to be our mesh. So I just connect my mesh to the geometry. And now if I select this project point uh, node, you can see that that grid of points was projected on top of my mesh. Oh, and actually we don't even need to delete the, the bottom part of the mesh. Before in older versions of uh, Rhino and, oh, sorry, in older versions of Grasshopper, it would project the points on top of the, you know, onto the top part of the mesh and also continue on and project a second set of points onto the bottom part, you know, onto the, the, this kind of bottom base, uh, base plate of, of the landscape. So it would make these kind of duplicate uh, projections. In this case, it seems to be solved and it's not, you know, it's, it's working fine. So we don't need to change anything about the mesh. That's, that's a nice quality of life improvement there. So now after project is working, I can disable the preview of the mesh so that we only see, you know, the projected points, you know, so something like this. We have the original grid, we have the projected points. All right. And now we need to, now we need to, create a surface from these. And this is a grid of points, which means we need a tool that generates a surface from a grid of points. And that tool is called surface from points. Surface from points. Right. Which asks us for three things. First one is give me a grid of points. Well, we do have a grid of points and that's the project uh, P output, like that. Then it asks us for how many points do you have in U direction? U uh, is the local X direction. So how many, how many points do you have in U direction? Well, I know that I have 21 points, right? Because we're using surface divide with a value of 20. And as we all know by now, it's always creating one more point than what kind of number we give it here. 
So it's creating 21 points. So what I can do is I can just take, the, take that slider of 20 and connect it as the U input in, into my surface grid like that. And now it turns red, of course. That's because it's, we do indeed have 21 points and here it just gets 20. So I will right click on the U input. I'll choose expression and I'll type in X plus one. Basically add plus one to anything that you plug in into U. So X plus one, commit changes, and now it just creates a surface for me. Okay. Let me know if it works, if, if this setup works for everyone, or, or rather let me know if it doesn't work for someone. Seems fine. Okay, super. But really, really works for everyone because uh, usually it's 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 very easy to to explain if 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 something is not you know to troubleshoot this part if something is not working. Hmm. Fine. So. Um, surface divide and project points uh, and surface grid right uh, or, or surface from points we have these three nodes out of these three nodes um, i will just leave the surface divide and surface grid uh, visible and i will hide the mesh and uh, project grid Pooh, sorry and, and and project point i will hide those two This is for me to show you that if I were to increase the V count, oh, by the way, um, don't increase it with just by moving a slider. This will make it lag quite a bit. Rather double click on it. So if you double click on the number of the slider, you can type in what kind of number you want, right? So, if, if you're moving the slider, that means it's going to calculate every step of the movement. Let's say you're moving the slider from 20 until 50. The way it's going to work, it's going to calculate 21, it's going to calculate 22, 23, and so on. You know, so, so it's going to keep recalculating the, 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 these nodes. If you're just double clicking on the Wait. Yeah, uh, just in a second. Um, if you were to double click on the slider and type in 50, right, and hit enter, then it's going to just calculate 20, uh, uh, the, 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 the values with 20, and then the, the, the values with 50, right? So, so this is the way of how you don't break it. Uh, if I was to move my, yeah, so Olga has already, and Andre ha, have already answered it. Uh, if now you choose your rectangle and you move it, the form will follow. So you can choose which part of the landscape you want to extract as a single surface. Um, oh. Let me just check the chat. Yeah, it's it's a nice little little tool uh, to have for sure. I I constantly use it um, for for various things. So now let's talk about resolution, right? Um, where's my grasshopper? Wait, ah, there we go. So let's talk about resolution. If 
my u and v count is set to be five, right? It has six by six points to rebuild the, 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 the mesh landscape. So it doesn't make sense, right? It, it, it just uses like those six by six points and it's trying to rebuild a high density landscape. So I get a very smooth curve, which kind of approximates how the landscape would look like, but it doesn't really fit that great. If I use, and if I increase the slider more and more, you can see that more and more details are starting to show up of the landscape, right? And after a while, after like, if, if I use more than 50 or so, or more than 70, um, the, it doesn't matter how much I increase the landscape anymore. Oh, sorry, how much I increase the resolution anymore. Uh, the limiting factor becomes the resolution of my base mesh, right? So I can't invent additional resolution by just increasing the slider. Um, so that's the limitation of it. 100 by 100 should be more than enough. Okay. And then all you need to do is just take it, right click on the surface grid, bake as a whatever. Uh, you can create a new layer or something like that. Move it to the side and just look at it, right? This is a single surface. I believe it's untrimmed. Uh, let's see. Yes, this is a not, not trimmed surface. So, so it's, you know, as clean as you can get. which means we can do a few more things with it. Right now, and, and let's do that in, 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 uh, in Rhino. So just save your definitions so that they work, uh, that you have them. And let me see where, where the heck my show selected. Oh, that's my, there's my mesh. So I'll just move my portion of the landscape to the side here like that. So how to further clean this, this up? First thing is we have, uh, th this is a single surface, meaning that Boolean operations will not work properly on it and you will not be able to use Boolean union, Boolean difference, Boolean split and so on with the surface. This needs to be a closed poly surface. So, um, we need to make it into a brick, just like I've done with this landscape here, uh, with the mesh landscape here. We need to make this guy into a brick as well. To do it, it's, it's kind of simple. You just select the shape and you type in duplicate border, dupe border, enter, which will give you the outer boundary of the landscape, All right? Once you have the outer boundary of the landscape with dupe border, you choose to project to C plane. C plane is the, in this case, and by default, it's the XY uh, grid, you know, XY plane, the flat plane of the ground. So project to C plane, enter, delete. It will ask you to, would you like to delete input objects or no? You choose no and hit enter. So now what I have here is I have a curve that is going around the, the perimeter of my landscape and I have a flat representation of the same curve that is right on the bottom of, of the world, right? So, so it's located directly on the XY plane. I will take this bottom curve, the flat rectangle, and I'll move it up somewhere closer to the landscape, 
right? So I'll just find the lowest point of the landscape and I'll kind of move it, you know, this is, I'm doing this by the eye, so I, I'm, I'll, I'll just move it somewhere, you know, closer. And, and you should be moving that rectangle straight up. If you move it, you know, at a weird angle, the next step is not going to work. Think of it this way, I'm making the brick less tall. <laughs> that, that's it. Um, next up is I take the outer perimeter of the landscape, I take the bottom perimeter, and I choose to loft. Loft, enter, enter, enter. Right, so I create this loft. Once I have that loft created, <clears throat> I don't need the curves anymore, so I just hit delete to get rid of the curves so that I only have the, the two, one, one polysurface and one surface. Right. And then one, uh, two last steps. One is selecting both of them and typing in join. So it joins up into one poly surface. And the last one is selecting it and typing in cap <clears throat> to fill in the bottom part. And that's it. You have the NURBS poly surface. If you <clears throat> now need to create a you know, some sort of a Boolean thing for it. You can Boolean difference. You know, you can carve into it easily and, and so on, right? So, so it just works. Chamfer edge, let's see if this works. Yeah, even this one works. <clears throat> Hmm, flat edge. I'm just double checking if if everything will work. Oh, cool. <clears throat> Even flat edge kind uh kinda works. Ew. That that part wasn't happy about the large fillet, but if I decrease the radius to something like two. Yeah, then it's happy. Yeah, <clears throat> you can do that, uh, the same thing in Grasshopper. Um, depending if you you will need to repeat it um, if you'll need to repeat those extractions but um, okay I'll, I'll show you how to do that in grasshopper as well so that's our surface here to duplicate border i think i can just do no there's no border okay so edges uh, b rep I choose to use BREP edges. Wait, there's a chat. No, oh, never mind. Um, I, I choose to use these BREP edges. And I can see that there's naked edges, inter interior, and non manifold edges. In this case, we only have like four naked edges. So I will use join curves to join them up. And now it's the same thing as using duplicate border, right? Uh, the output of this is a single closed curve. So then I can use um, project. Uh, and I, I just find the one that says project an object onto a plane, right? So, so if you type in project and you hover your mouse over different project, um, uh, versions, uh, 
then one of them is going to be project an object onto a plane. I choose that one. The geometry that I project is my joint curve, something like that. And uh, projection plane by default is said to be world X, Y, which is already great, uh, you know, already fine. I can use it. And then um, I just simply use loft. And holding down the shift key, I connect the joint, uh, joint boundary. And then I connect the projected boundary like this. So I get the box. And basically here, I have the top surface and I have the lofted perimeter. So I will use brep join to join up the top surface and holding down the shift key, join up the, 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 the loft like that. So now this is a single uh, open poly surface. And then on, on it, I'll just use cap. Cap holes, sorry. Cap holes, like that. Ew, uh, doesn't like it. Why doesn't it like it? Because, yeah, this, this is what sometimes happens. The output is data with two branches after joining, meaning it's still uh, two separate uh, B-reps. So, to fix this, I will right click on the B input of the join, not output, input. And I'll choose flatten. So I'm forcing the join to receive a single list of things so that it can work properly. And then once it works properly, properly cap will work properly. So now let's double check it. We have this box here. If I move this curve to the side, yeah. So now I can extract any part of the landscape. Um, what do you mean by borders? Uh, can you in some way extract the borders from the... But solid volume doesn't have borders. That's what makes it solid. Duplicate border gives you the, 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 the a curves where you would have a hole right, where the, the, the surface stops. Meaning that if it's a solid volume, it doesn't have any openings, such as, you know, l l let's say like that, cube, right? All that cube has are these edges here. These are not borders, these are edges, right? So, I don't know uh, how to. If you explode first, yeah, but what would be the purpose of it? I mean, you can use duplicate edge instead of duplicate border. So you can use duplicate edge and just choose what kind of edges you want to extract, if, if, if that was the, the, the question. But this one, since it doesn't have any openings, uh, you can't, oh, okay, so, so it's duplicate, uh, dupe edge. Yeah, so edge and border are two different things. Uh, edge is something that, um, 
let's say it like that. A border is a type of the edge that is not surrounded by surfaces or polygons, right? So think of it in this way. If um, planner surface, copy, join, okay. So, and, and, and let me make this into this kind of shape. So this edge right at the middle is what is called an interior edge. And these edges around the perimeter are exterior edges or naked edges. Meaning that if I use a duplicate border, it will give me all of the exterior edges. And those are, uh, to define them, every edge that only has one surface on either side of it, for instance, this edge right here, it only has one surface you know, uh, attached to it. Every edge that has only one surface attached to it is considered to be a naked edge. And the collection of naked edges is a border, right? Any edge that has two surfaces attached to it is an interior edge, meaning it's inside of the geometry. So for instance, a cube doesn't have um, naked edges, right? All of its edges are, will always have two surfaces connecting to them. While a single surface doesn't have any interior edges, meaning that all of its edges will only have one surface connecting to them. And there is the third type. Um, if an edge has three surfaces, attached to it. Yeah, I can't even do that. Uh, it, it won't let me, but sometimes it breaks and it kind of joins it up like so. If a surface has three edges attached to it, that means it's a, it's a non-manifold edge. So this is the third type, three or more, sorry, three or more surfaces attached to it. It's a non-manifold edge, meaning that it, um, it's a third type of, 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 of an edge that shares uh, uh, three surfaces. Um, and those kind of edges screw up your, your model and make it either un-3D printable or at very least very, very weak when you try to print it. And it makes a lot of errors. Uh, I can explain it in this way. Um, Wait, let me show color back faces. I'll make this blue. So now all of the back, uh, the back of my surfaces are colored to be blue, right? So a surface has a front face and the back face. Not just the surface, a mesh as well. Every polygon in a mesh also has a front face and a back face. So in this case, you know, this is the front face, this is the front face, these are the back faces. This is the front face, this is the back face. When you have a non-manifold edge, it doesn't matter how many times you flip it, flip, flip, right? So, so these two align, these two align, but now these two don't align. It doesn't matter how many times you do it, um, the front faces and the back faces will never align, meaning that the geometry that you do, which contains at least one non-manifold edge, cannot have information about what is outside and what is inside. Because at a, at a certain point, at a certain area, it is going to, you know, do this what was outside becomes inside and what was inside becomes outside. So you should be mindful of, of, of these non-manifold edges and 
always kind of model in a way that you don't see them. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so now what you do is um, if you open up, yeah, let, let's say it like that. If you open up the syllabus and you look at the area scheduling of, of the Naturum Center, you will kind of be able to guess what, uh, or, or kind of you'll be able to see what kind of size of of a building or of, of a form you will need in, in reality. And it, it can be very rough right now. Um, I'm not telling you the size simply because it's a good exercise always to, you know, to, to, to practice and to determine the size of the building by yourself. This is one of the things that the more you do it, the better you get at it. Um, so things to do are, uh, with, with that landscape, where's my freaking grasshopper? Uh, like that. So you you choose what kind of uh, which portion of the landscape you're going to be working with, two hundred by two hundred meters. You determine what is going to be the size of your building, and also what is going to be the height of your building. So let's say, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm just going to do s something, you know, very simple, but let's say a box that is, let's say my building is 30 meters enter by 10 meters enter, and the height of it is going to be five meters. Good. I'm, I'm just doing a box. In your case, of course, it's not a box. And I'll just position my building or my form in the landscape. You don't need to start working on the landscape. This is, uh, we're going to be doing that next week. You know, working on the connection between the building and the landscape. But it is very important that the forms that you have right now, that you don't do, uh, that you don't do something like, something like, this, right? Oh yeah, uh, and and uh, those two hundred by two hundred uh, meters is just something that I chose. So you, so you can uh, you can do any kind of a any kind of a rectangle. Keep in mind the larger the rectangle, the more points you will need. You know, the the the, the bigger the count uh, will need to be here. So for 200 by 200, usually 100 by 100 points works because then we have a resolution of two, every two meters, you get a point, right? Because we have 200 by 200 square and we're dividing that square into 100 by 100, which means every one meter, oh, uh, sorry, every two meters, you get a point. And uh, I think that's good enough uh, resolution at this stage. Um, so back to here, we still have five minutes left. Uh, so let me just, and, and this is very important. So, so, so listen up. Um, that box right here represents what you shouldn't do, right? And it represents why uh, we're doing what we're doing right now. So right now the, 
your the the forms the the conceptual forms that you have um right now the forms that you have uh are abstract because we were modeling them uh or simulating them in a vacuum you know without any kind of a um logic of scale and and so on and also uh you have sketches right you, you you have sketches that you have done during the metaphor workshop so now that the it is time to take the forms and start changing them completely right change uh, yeah changing them and the the two main driving factors how you change the forms are first your sketches from the metaphor workshop second the actual scale of how the building will need to to be right if if you have a form that's doing this there is no way that this is going to be a, you know a, a naturum building in in malmo instead you need to be uh you know look at references of a naturum get inspired um you can't do cnc milling in the school right now um uh, because it's closed not the school the the, the wood workshop uh but i will be uh giving a tutorial on how to set up the file for cnc milling uh probably either by the end of this week uh not the end but the, the middle of this week so on, on wednesday or early next week on monday or, or or tuesday of next week um so that once we have access uh, to the wood workshop we can use it uh, for uh, cnc milling but for now uh we're stuck with you know kind of 3d printing uh, yeah <clears throat> and that is what that is the next tutorial that i would like to give you it's how to uh, basically what kind of forms can you have for for 3d printing before i do that let me fdm 3d printing printing let me just give you a, a short intro um Uh, just a sec, Axel. Um, I'll, I'll just give you a short intro to, to what 3D printing is and how it's done. And then we will uh, continue on looking in Rhino how to, what, what kind of forms and what kind of, not, not forms, but uh, w what types of geometries can be used for, for 3D printing. Um, did we manage to set up a plan for, the, uh, for 3D printing? Uh, kind of. Um, I need to, I will be creating a separate list in the Google Doc uh, that we have. Uh, where is it? In this Google Doc, I will be uh, creating a separate list uh, somewhere here with all of the students uh, who will be able to uh, use 3D printers in the school. Um, and, and, and we'll see how we can arrange 3D printing from there on out. We will start 3D printing this uh, Thursday. So we still have uh, qu quite some time um, until that happens. But uh, we're, we're getting there. It's, it's almost, almost done. So um, 3D printing wise, it all started with <clears throat> if, with this kind of 3D printing, uh, DLP uh, 3D printing, with these kind of uh, resin-based uh, 3D printers, where where you would have either an LCD screen or a laser or or a, um, LED light uh, that that would uh, solidify resin. So the first 3D printers that were patented uh, were actually using resin and kind of um, uh, uh, building up the, the models layer by la layer, but uh, through solidifying uh, liquid resin. Um, there are quite a few printers. 
There we go. This is a, a little bit better. There are quite a few printers uh, these days which are doing that and they have really high resolution. But the problem is that they use resin, which is uh, highly toxic and we cannot have them in the school. Um, I think IKDC has, has like one of those, but uh, th those are really not user friendly for, for, for beginners. So instead what we use is a second pattern that was done and that is uh, FDM, 3D printers. Um, so, so these are the 3D printers that we use and the, the way they work, actually this is a, a very good diagram, is that you have a print surface, a print bed, this is like a section of, of the thing, uh, of the 3D printer. So you have a print bed and you have a, a, a nozzle which uh, kind of squirts out the filament and it's building up the form on on your uh, base plate or, or on your print bed, layer by layer, right? Um, in, in, in molten plastic. So by the end of uh, you know, the printing process, you get, yeah, let, let's say like this, you get these kind of shapes. So all of these shapes are made out of uh, separate layers. Oh, this is even better, you know, se separate layers. Um, so the hot end itself is, is the hot part and the build platform uh, is, is also kind of hot. The build platform goes up to, well, in our case, it will only go up to 60 degrees because we'll be printing in uh, uh, what's called the PLA plastic. And I will talk about different kinds of plastics and so on later on. Um, and the hot end, the heated nozzle, which actually melts the plastic and lays it layer by layer. Um, heats up to around, um, in, in case of PLA, to around 200 degrees, which is uh, not that nice to touch, right? So, so you'll need to be mindful of, you know, that, that part being hot, but it's well protected and it's, you know, you really need to try to burn yourself uh, to be able to actually burn yourself. Like really try hard to do that. Uh, the build plate, Again, 60 degrees, not that big of a deal if you, you know, if you touch it or, or even hold on to it. Um, it's, it's, it's fine, it's, it's just warm, it's not hot or anything. Um, so printer-wise, we are using a Cartesian type, we will be using Cartesian type printers. So what Cartesian means, it's, it comes from a Cartesian coordinates. Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, Z, right? So it comes from uh, these kind of X, Y, Z coordinates. And as you can see, um, for instance, this guy is a Cartesian style uh, 3D printer. And most of them are kind of the, the, the same um, so you have a build plate, build surface, which moves in, uh, which can only move in one direction, right? So it only moves in Y uh, around, uh, along the Y axis. Then you have uh, the hot end, which is this part right here, which also can only move in one direction and it moves in X, uh, in X direction, right? Like so. So you have X and Y movement just from uh, the hot end and the heated bed. And then as you can see, the whole gantry of uh, the hot end can be moved up along these rods in Z axis, right? So the way it works, it kind of moves the bed and the hot end at the same time to produce a single layer then moves up one step in the Z and continues, continues on doing the second layer, moves up in Z again, continues on and kind of builds up your model uh, layer by layer. Let me uh, close that one. The printers that we're uh, using are uh, Prusa i3 style printers, so these guys right here, and uh, I will have a separate tutorial about those uh, in a bit. 
the main thing to know about them is that that nozzle that distributes the, 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 the molten plastic, the diameter of that nozzle is 0 0.4 millimeters, right? Meaning that if you have anything thinner than in, in your model at any kind of section, if you have anything thinner than 0 0.4 millimeters, it will not print, right? So, so that's an important, important distinction. Um, other than that, <clears throat> there are not a lot of limitations. Oh yeah, the build plate volume uh, is 20 by 20 by 20 centimeters, but we will not be printing anything that big. Uh, it's definitely not for your first prints. We will be printing something that's like five by five by five centimeters or seven by seven by seven centimeters, not bigger than that. And that's going to be your first print. Later on, we can do a little bit bigger stuff, but uh, trust me, you don't, you know, there's no need to, to have these kind of large 20 by 20 by 20 centimeter models of a, you know, abstract geometry that's not really, you know, that you will throw out uh, once you have the next version of, of it. And also the print times are insane when it comes down to, you know, large, large prints. So seven by seven by seven centimeters, I think is going to be the sweet spot. Um, back to here, wait, let me see. Uh -huh. Back to here in, <clears throat> in Grasshopper, oh, sorry, in Rhino. Um, I'll just show you things that you should uh, be mindful of when setting up the model to be 3D printed. So the first thing is uh, what kind of units you use. In this case, here I have it set to be meters, meaning that this is, if I measure it distance from this point to this point, it's going to say 200 meters, right? So the scale is way off. Yes, I am. I've, I've been recording for the whole time. Uh, the, the, the scale is way off, um, which means that I will need to uh, scale this down for, it to be, uh, for me to be able to fit it in my print bed. Um, usually, when I set up something for, uh, when I'm setting up something for printing, I, I create a new file, right? So, so I set up a new Rhino file. I'll just open up Rhino again, like that. And then I will make sure that this is set to be millimeters rather than meters, right? So millimeters, if it, if it's not set to be millimeters, you just type in units. And here in model units, you just change it to millimeters. <clears throat> All right. And now uh, in millimeters, um, I, I, I will import my form. And let's say my form is some sort of a, let me do box, well, rather, let me do something like this box and let me just draw uh, a sphere here and use Boolean difference to do something with it. That, that doesn't matter, right? So, some sort of a shape. So I have imported my shape into my, you know, file, which I'll be using to set up the print. And the first thing that I do is I define the size of it, right? So here, if I measure the distance from, let's say, this point to this point, I can see that the distance is 6,833 millimeters, which is way too big. I need it to be 70 millimeters long, right? So I can just select my shape and I can type in scale, enter. And then instead of... Um, well, I, I will specify the base point, which is going to be the bottom corner of my shape. 
And instead of specifying the scaling factor, I will click on uh, another corner point of the box. In, in this case, this, this bottom corner point here. Click here. And then I will just type in what kind of distance I want to have between those two points. So I will just type in 70, 70 millimeters, enter. And now my shape, zoom selected, my shape is scaled to, to be the size of uh, the, this edge to be 70 millimeters long. All right. So I have my, my box here. For instance, this guy right here is absolutely 3D printable, right? But it, it is just a box, so of course it is. Um, let me show you, yeah, uh, let me show you what types of geometries are not 3D printable. For instance, so this is good if I were to, extract surface. If, if I had a shape like, like this, the, uh, it doesn't have a top or even worse, something like this. This is not 3D printable because it doesn't have a volume, meaning it's uh, an open poly surface and all of the surfaces that are making it are infinitely thin meaning the, the, the slicer the, or the 3D printer itself will not understand that this is some sort of a form that, that you can print. Think of it this way. The form that you want to 3D print needs to be watertight, meaning that you need to be able, uh, if you had water in it, the water would not seep out through any hole, any opening, or anything like that, such as this, this form right here. This is not definitely not watertight, right? It's, it's, it's open. So anything that you do needs to have a volume. The easiest way to check is if you select the shape and you type in what, it needs to say uh, that it's a valid shape, and that it's a closed solid shape or, or a closed shape. So it needs to be valid and it needs to be closed, right? If I select this guy and I type in what, then I can see that it, it is indeed a valid shape, right? So it's, it's, it doesn't have any errors, but it is open, meaning there's no way of how to tell what's inside and what is outside of the shape. So that's one thing that, that you need to be very mindful of, op open things. Um, another thing that, that tends to be very bad is non-manifold edges. So for instance, if I were to make a copy of this guy, kind of have a shape like this, right? And let's say for some reason, um, this, this kind of shape is joint for you and it kind of, you know, it, 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 it treats it as a single poly surface. Um, then this edge right here is going to, if, hmm, how do I show this clipping plane as the 3d printer is creating layer after layer of your shape right, and, and printing it up. That intersection point here is going to be infinitely thin, meaning that your shape is going to immediately break. First of all, it's not going to be printed properly in, the, in this part, but also it is going to break uh, later on uh, once you either try to remove it from the print bed or, or even before that it's going to break into two parts, right? So those non-manifold edges, those edges that share more than one surface, make your model either not 3D printable at all, or they make it um, uh, very, very weak on, on, on those parts. Other than that, um, well, I guess there are a few things uh, that, that I can 
uh, tell you. Since this is uh, a layer by layer process, if you have, um, let's see, something like this, Boolean union, something like this going on, right? This kind of cantilever. And let me create a clipping plane. Um, let's say the form that we had, that, that we have this form is being 3D printed, right? So it's, it's starting from, uh, from the first layer and it's, it keeps building it up, right? So I'll be moving this, uh, the, the, the clipping plane just to show you how it's being built up, right? So it just keeps going. So that's, that's easy for it. It's just doing rectangle on top of a rectangle over and over again. The rectangles start changing. So it keeps moving more and more. And then suddenly at this layer, it needs to create um, a surface on nothing, right? On thin air, right? So there is, there is this kind of a, a 0 0.2. There we go. So, uh, wait, 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 wait. So there is this kind of a nozzle, right? That keeps m moving and, and trying to lay plastic, right? And as it's reaching the bottom uh, layer of, of this uh, box right here, it's going to go and lay the plastic on thin air. Uh, where is it? Wait, there we go. So it's going to come in and you, you already have a box here and then this layer is going to be printed as if uh, this nozzle just kind of moves out of the box and starts printing on thin air, which means that any cantilever needs to have a support system in place, you know, s something that supports it. Um, thankfully, the, the, the programs that are used to slice up your model into these kind of sections, and I will be talking about those tomorrow, those kind of forms uh, have uh, automated supporting system for these kind of cantilevers, but you need to be mindful of that. You know, that it's, it's a thing that, that, that is going to happen, that there is going to be certain amount of plastic here that you will need to remove after you have finished 3, uh, 3D printing. Right, so, so that's uh, cantilevers. And back to here, uh, really thin walls. So for instance, if I have a wall that is 0 0.3 millimeters long, right? If there is, if my shape, uh, Boolean union. If my shape has a wall that is very, very thin, and my actual diameter of the nozzle is, ah, where is it? There we go, 0 0.2, like that. Something like, ah, let, let me make this smaller and move it down, zoom into it. So if I have a nozzle that is wider than the wall that needs to be printed out, the wall itself will be ignored, right? So if you have something very thin, that is just going to be completely ignored by 3D printer and not printed out. So the minimum, absolute minimum uh, thickness of a wall is 0 0.4 millimeters. But keep in mind that if you're printing something that is 0 0.4 millimeters thick, it is going to uh, be extremely weak and it is uh, going to have a very, very poor uh, surface quality. So, so, so the, 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 the quality of the 3D print itself is going to be very, very bad. 
rule of thumb is three, um, the nozzle that you have, in this case 0 0.4, you need to multiply, multiply it three times and then you will know, you know what's the minimum thickness for decent quality, for a decent quality print. So in your case, the minimum thickness of the wall can be, uh, should be 1.2 millimeters. And that is bare minimum. Anything lower than that will start making mistakes and it will look horrible once it's printed out. So back to here, let me just quickly, wait, let me just quickly uh, cr create a, a, a shape to show you. Uh, what do we use? Let's use, what is this? Lengths, vertex loads. Yeah, sure, we can use that. Uh -huh. That guy, bake it out, okay, close that, um, there we go. Uh, so here I have baked out just a mesh, you know, just, just as an example, a kangaroo mesh. Um, oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention one thing. 3D printing uh, doesn't work with poly surfaces. It works with meshes. So if you have something like, if you have something like a poly surface, then before you 3D print it, you will need to use mesh command on it. To, to create a mesh from the poly surface, right? So this is a poly surface and this is a mesh representation of that poly surface. So 3D printers only work with, well, 3D printers work with G-code, but the slicers that produce the G-code work with uh, only with meshes. Keep that in mind. Anything that you do will need to be translated into a mesh to, for it to be printed. Uh, yes, this uh, this applies to resin printers as well. Uh, and uh, I, I, it also applies to metal printers. It applies to, so, so, so there's like metal 3D printing where, where you can print out uh, metal parts. Uh, there, there is uh, SLS uh, 3D printing which is kind of powder-based, plastic powder-based 3D printing. So all of 3D printing is done, uh, so it's, it's meshes that you want for 3D printing. For CNC milling though, uh, you can choose. You can choose either a mesh or a NURBS poly surface, um, or a NURBS surface even, but, but for 3D printing it's meshes. So for instance, Anything that you get from cocoon, kangaroo, um, what else? Uh, the, 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 the game of life and so on. All of those are already meshes, so you don't need to worry about those. Um, you'll just be basically using mesh tools, uh, meshing tools on them. Uh, but anything that you model out in Rhino, because you're modeling as a NURBS poly surface, um, modeling it out as nerves poly surface, you'll need to mesh it before 3D printing. So um, this guy right here, the first thing that I want to do for, for this one, this is just a live example of how I would set it up for 3D printing. The th first thing that I want to do is I want to select the guy, uh, type in bounding box and create a box around it, right? This box I'm going to use to scale it down to proper size, right? So I will find the longest uh, edge of the box and use scale. I'll specify one side of the, I'll, I'll click on one part of the edge here. I'll click on the second part of the edge and I will type in 70, you know, because I want it to be seven centimeters long. 
70, enter. Then I don't need the bounding box anymore, so I just delete it. And I have my shape that is uh, seven centimeters, uh, that is seven centimeters long, right? So that's first part. And it's very important to scale it to the proper size before uh, doing anything else with it, simply because if you give it thickness and then you scale it down, the thickness will also scale down, right? So it doesn't make any sense to do it before. Speaking of giving it thickness, I will be selecting the shape. And here it's, it's a mesh, right? So like offset surface will not, will not work on it. I cannot, you know, I cannot click on it. So a mesh has its own set of uh, tools that you can use and it's under mesh tools. Here you have plenty of, of, of tools that, that you can use for a mesh. So in this case, I want to use um, offset mesh and I don't know which one of these it is. So I will just be doing it with, with this guy here. I'll select it and type in offset mesh. Hit enter. And here I have a few, few different things to change. So first one is offset distance and this is set to be two millimeters. Um, I will be changing this to something slightly smaller. So I already mentioned this, uh, the minimum thickness is 1.2 millimeters. So uh, just to be safe, I'll be choosing 1.6 millimeters as my offset distance. Increment, uh, at this stage, don't, don't worry about the increment, just keep it as one, that's fine. Um, and then I will make sure that it's set to be solid and that uh, delete input meshes is turned on, right? So solid on, delete input meshes on, and I just hit offset. And you can see my whole surface, uh, sorry, my whole mesh is uh, now, it now has thickness. So if I create uh, slices through it, all of the slices will have, um, uh, will have thickness. And there are a few problems when you use offset mesh, especially on a surface that is, or a mesh that, that is bending quite heavily. And let me find those. This is fine. Where, where did I see it? Huh. Well, I guess you could say this one is a bit broken. Oh, 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 there we go. Okay, that's good, that's good. Th this part's right here. So you can see that arc that we have, as we're giving it thickness, it cannot fit. The thickness cannot fit because it's bending too fast. So it starts making these kind of self intersections, right? So you can see those here and here and certain parts here. Um, those self intersections are not necessarily uh, something that will destroy your print or, or something that will not work, but it's something that, you know, doesn't look that nice. That, that, that's about it. Um, I can still select the mesh and I can type in what, and I can see that it's, it says valid mesh, dub, uh, closed. That's a very important thing. Double precision polygon mesh valid and closed. If it's valid and closed, it means it's going to be 3D printable. So I have a shape here, right? Of, of, of that, that is indeed 3D printable. If I want to um, fix this part, I would need to go back into Grasshopper and rearrange the you know, the anchor points and the patches and so on for this guy to be, uh, to be clean. There's no way to just, you know, type in command, make mesh, you know, make mesh clean. There, there, there's no, no, no way to, to do that. Right, but this is a, you know, a 3D printable mesh. <clears throat> and those of you who are working with Game of Life, um, 
by default, it always will give you a 3D printable mesh uh, already, and you will not need to do any additional work on it, but you will have other problems when it comes down to be, uh, being able to control uh, the, the, the definition itself. All right, so, so, so that's that. We still have uh, five minutes left, and uh, I, I want to, and uh, once this session is done, we will break for, for a longer lunch because uh, we were quite fast with this. Uh, so now I just want to ask, uh, do you have any questions or you know, is, is, is there anything that is not clear? We will spend these five minutes uh, going, through, uh, going through your questions. Should I show something or, or show, show something again? And don't be shy. How do you know if it's smaller than 0 0.4 millimeters? Okay, uh, so so I'll I'll start from the from from Lucas and then continue on. Uh, how do you know if it's smaller than 0 0.4 millimeters? Um, if uh, well, you just use distance. Right. You just use distance and you kind of measure between two points. Um, also, also, tomorrow I'll show you how to slice it up. You will definitely notice that something is smaller than 0 0.4 millimeters when you try to prepare it for 3D printing. Uh, it will just simply, it will simply not show up in the slicing software, right? So uh, there's two ways. It's either measuring it in Rhino or straight up importing it into the slicing software and then seeing that, oh crap, half of my geometry is gone and then increasing the thickness. But again, um, you should never have that problem of 0 0.4 millimeters uh, because if it's something that, that is 0 0.4 millimeters thick, I give it 90% chance of the, the, the shape failing to print. Like 10% chance for it to actually succeed in printing, but looking really, really bad. And 90% that it's just going to fail uh, immediately. You know, when you try to print something that thin and that small, it's just going to vibrate like crazy and it's gonna be bad. Um, do you have any examples of buildings or structures that are using specific tools, Cocoon Game of Life, so we have more of an idea of what possibilities with the tools are? There are no examples because this studio um, works with modern uh, approaches and modern tools, meaning that these tools have not yet been implemented in, uh, in the real world. <laughs> in the real world. <laughs> Well, in the industry, um, they are going to, uh, there are a few projects that are kind of underway, but those will only uh, be pavilions and something very, very, very simplistic. I give it around five or 10 years until you will see first, uh, first buildings like that. The Game of Life one is uh, done by me and Olga. The, the, the script itself is done by me and Olga and uh, the industry, the, the, there's no, you know, it's, the industry doesn't know about it, right? It, it, it's something that is, is used just for, for Lund University. Of course, I have open uh, open tutorials, and anyone can look at those. But uh, it, it, it's something that is just for for Lund University. Uh, is it cheaper to make three D printed molding forms instead of three D printing every part of a building? Yes, it is, absolutely. But that means that then you work with um, you work with modular uh, forms. Recording. There we go. So now we're recording. Um, where was I? Uh, so the tutorials, the, the, these kind of a one-off tutorials are, are going to be kind of short. 
Um, and I'll be just showing you like separate functionalities that you can incorporate into your this kind of relaxed kangaroo meshes and whatnot. Um, so first of all, I, I, I don't want to waste any time. I'll just jump right into it. You should all have um, some form of kangaroo script opened up. Doesn't matter what kind of script you have. Um, and, and let's let's begin. So here, <clears throat> this this setup right here that we have, most of the time it produces uh, what's called a, 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 a compression only based mesh or a compression only based structure, meaning that all of the forces that are um, being applied to this uh, to this form are only compression. There's no tension in the form. And as long as you have only compression in the form, that means you don't need to do any um, gluing of the parts. <clears throat> Sorry. So all of your joints can be just position, positioning joints rather than holding joints uh, for the elements. And that's what we've seen Philip Block did with his armadillo pavilion and um, and pavilions that came after that. Um, said that, this is not what would be considered a perfectly smooth surface. So this is not a, a, a surface that has zero mean curvature. Um, if I were to big this out, and you don't need to do this, this is just for me to, to show it. If I were to big this out, kind of show it like so. Oh, by the way, I have back faces uh, being colored blue. Don't worry about that part. Um, and if I were to ask for curvature analysis, oh yeah, I, crap, I can't do that. I forgot that this is a mesh. Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so this is not a perfectly smooth surface. That, that's all that matters. Uh, you, there are plugins that do curvature analysis for meshes as well, but uh, we don't want to use those. That's unimportant. So the first thing that I want to check out is how do I make this surface perfectly smooth, meaning that there are no um, really sharp bends and it doesn't quickly turn or, or, or you know, do, do anything quickly. Um, to do that, in Kangaroo 2, there's a goal <clears throat> that is called smooth. And I don't really remember where it is. I assume it's goals mesh. Yes, goals mesh smooth. The one that has the ironing thingy, iron, um, as an icon. Or you can just type in smooth and find the one that says, uh, that has the iron icon in it. So smooth, and it asks us for two things. The first one is give me a mesh to smooth, and the second one, and this is a goal, right? So it comes before the, the, the solver. It's going to plug in into one of the inputs of Antwine. So back to inputs. Um, one of them asks for a mesh to smooth, and the other one asks for what kind of smoothing strength should it, should it use. So first, let's start with the smoothing strength, and I'll use smoothing. Uh, I'll use a slider, and I'll do something like zero dot dot a thousand. So in between a zero and a thousand smoothing strength. And for now, I'll have it set to be zero. I'll just plug it in, in, in into the smooth, <clears throat> like that. Um, Next up, mesh to input, right? So as, as per usual, the, the same mesh that we input to show, the same mesh that we input to the edge length is the, going to be the same mesh that we input to the smooth. Wait, there's someone. What's the password? Why, wait, let me just try and invite Andre, invite to meeting. Oh, Andre is in the meeting. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, 
so it's going to be the same mesh for the smooth. So I'll just grab my unify normals output and connect it to the smooth mesh input, right? Like so. Um, and then it asks me, not asks me, but it gives me an output, which is a goal, um, which I need to connect to all other outputs uh, for the entwine, right? Oh, with all of the inputs of the entwine. So I'll just zoom in to my entwine node. And as I zoom in, you can see these minus and plus signs. If I click on the bottom plus sign, you can only see those when you zoom in, by the way. If, you cl if I click on that, another input will be created. And then I can just simply uh, connect my smooth goal to that input like so. I'll reset the simulation and then you can see here nothing changed and that's because the smooth is it has strength of zero meaning it you know it doesn't work uh, it's off but if i increase the strength until a thousand you can see that everything here kind of became much more t uh, is, is the word tapered well uh, starts to curve out much more and that is to incorporate the quick to, to distribute the quick changes in curvature throughout the whole surface so right now the surface does has much less quick bends than it had before if i turn this back to zero and let me kind of ang angle it this way. If I turn this back to zero, slowly, you can see how you know, the, the, this, this becomes much more uh, calm. Even though it's, it's, the curvature is calmer here, uh, at certain places, it, it is going to be bending more, right? So that's what... Uh, what smoothing does. It kind of distributes the bending of the surface uh, throughout the whole surface rather than just uh, to certain points or, or certain areas of the surface. So that's the first thing. And usually you don't use, you know, full on a thousand strength of smoothing. You usually use something like, uh, I don't know, a hundred, maybe 50, maybe less. It, it, all really depends on what what you're after right so there's no correct value for smoothing so that's the first thing that's that's the smooth goal uh, there are as you can see here a crap ton of goals and some of them are, are nice some of them will definitely break your your shape um, the only way for you to kind of understand how those goals work is by either uh, searching for a YouTube video about them or just simply plugging them in and seeing, you know, how do they change the, 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 the surface. So it's, it's learning by doing. Um, there is one more thing for today that I want to show. So the first one was smoothing. The second one is here, since we are uh, creating everything from patches, these guys, you will always have this kind of a linear, uh, linear uh, footprint, right? So, so the whole structure rests at the ground plane at a line here, here, and in this case here, it's three lines, but it's the same thing, right? It's, it's a polyline. What if I want to have a curved footprint? It would make much more sense, right? Considering the, the structure that we have. You can do that. And you can do that by um, creating curves <clears throat> along the, oh, let's do it. So first things first, uh, so, so you would be creating curves along uh, where the building meets the ground. But first things first, I want to uh, create separate layers for separate types of curves that I have. 
right? So I'll create a new layer and I'll call it um, patch or patches, right? And those are going to be my rectangles that I've used. Let me just select those. Those are going to be my rectangles that I'm using to create the shape. So working, uh, working with layers really helps you clean up the geometry. So I've just selected all of my patches from which the mesh is created and I've just put them in a separate layer and let me make it uh, blue, whatever. Then I have, I'll create a new layer again and call, the, call it anchor regions. So those are going to be the regions in which the points are going to be locked, right? So those are my four regions here. And I'll make those, uh, I don't know, green or red, red, I guess, red. So I have that. And then that I will create a, one more layer and I call it, I'll call it footprint curves. Footprint curves, I'll keep it black. I'll make sure that it's my active layer and I'll create this kind of a, let's just do it with one curve now and then we will uh, do it with the rest. So I'll create a curve like this, somewhere near one of my, um, one of my uh, places where, where the building meets the, the, the ground, right? And I'll reference it in, oh, wait. I'll reference it in into Grasshopper as a curve, CRV, curve, right click, set one curve. Okay, so now it's referenced. And then I will play around with the anchors, which are here. So you can see here that in my Grasshopper definition, I have points that should be locked but I also have the target for the, boy, the points to be moved towards as they're being locked. So we didn't work with target up until now, but now this is the time when we are indeed going to work with it. So I will make a, a little bit of room just below my anchor uh, node. I'll place my referenced and curve somewhere near here. So, um, what do we have here in, 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 in our anchor goal? We have all of the points of the mesh, like right, from ViewerBird vertices component. We're checking whether or not those points are inside or outside of, of our red uh, regions. And we are removing all of the points that are outside, right? So we're just left with these points. And then we are saying lock those points in place as a goal. So what, what would happen if I said that um, these points that are locked, oh crap, it won't work with one curve. Crap, okay. Uh, let me finish my, my thought first and then we will, uh, we will see. Um, so what would happen if we said that the, for instance, these points should find the closest curve, in this case, this guy, this arc here, and it should find the closest point on that curve and kind of snap to it, right? That should probably work. We'll see. Um, let me just find one more, one last thing. And it's, I think there's a, Keep point on given curve. Hmm. Can we use that? Now, for now, let's let's do it uh, the brute force way, and then we'll see how to kind of make it nicer later. So, we constantly use this, and we will be using it again. Uh, pull point. We'll be using this tool. Pull a point to a variety of geometry, right? And that's because pull point always finds the closest geometry towards which it should be pulled. 
right now, since I only drew one curve, and that's why I said it won't work, all of these points, not just from this leg, but from all of the legs, will be pulled towards this curve. And actually, I can show you how that would look like. So we have all of the points here. I will connect those uh, to my P input of the pull point. And we have our single curve here. So I'll connect it to my uh, G input. And these points are being pulled there. And then I can just say that the pulled points, the ones that are recreated on the curve, are my target for the anchor. And as I do that, my whole structure kind of, I can reset it. My whole structure kind of crams itself onto that curve. That's because I don't have any more curves here. Let me stop the simulation for a bit and reset it. And I will just create a curve for every leg for, and, and also a curve for, for this portion here. So, um, a curve here. Mm -hmm. okay. A curve here. And let's say a curve here. Let me just move it so that it aligns more nicely. So now I have four curves. Let me reference those four curves. So I'll just select them, go back here to where I have my curve that pulls uh, component, right click on it and clear, and then right click again and set multiple curves. So those four curves are now set. Let's see if that works. I will reset one more time just to be sure and hit true and now you can see all of these points are being snapped to the curve like so and in doing so i can then move this curve back and forth and kind of you can't move it too far but i can kind of adjust it just slightly because now the points will be snapped to the curve so all we needed to do was just create a few arcs here and use pull point on those arcs to make sure that um, the, the, the position of the points changes. Works? Does, does that make sense or, or do you have any, any questions about this? Okay. Okay, that's good. Uh, so again, I mean, I, I can show you one thing uh, and uh, we'll see if it's, is it possible to create a tapered V point look? Who, um, ex explain it in different way. <laughs> Is it possible to create a tapered V point look from this? What's a V point? Uh, I, I, I'm trying to. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you can, or I mean, you can always take the curve and kind of shrink it down uh, and, and, until it's almost like a, a single point and then it's, it's, it's going to work. It's going to mess up the mesh though 
Even here, you can see that the mesh starts becoming a little bit unhappy um, about it. So it is going to start messing it up a little bit. But um, in regards to a pointy mesh, it's much better to, uh, like to, to a single point connection. Uh, it's it's much better to work with these regions and just you know kind of choose just a corner point a single corner point and lock that in place. Uh, let me see what you sent me. Open file. <laughs> uh, so that happens. First of all, uh, try. Try resetting the, the the simulation. Maybe that will help. And second of all, um, I wonder which point gets moved there. Make the arc in the middle. The one. Uh, the, let me show you. Let me try and replicate that. Um, I assume if I have this somewhere here, no, somewhere here, no, here, no, here, here. How the hell do you, here, no, no. Hmm. Or could it be that you have um, a region here yeah, yeah, okay, so so I think I know what, what's the culprit. You have one more region for anchoring here. I deleted that region, so I have only a hole here, right? So you have additional region here, and let me, now I know how to replicate it. Uh, da, da, da. Set multiple, reset. Ah, uh, Wait, yeah, there we go. So now in my case, it's, it's, it's connecting, uh, connecting to that, right? That's because this region doesn't have a curve to snap to, right? So the, the, the points that are inside of this region, uh, these guys here, they don't have anywhere to snap to, meaning they will find either this curve or this curve as it uh, this or this curve as the closest curve and they will snap to it but if you draw one more curve here like that then they will uh, they will work uh, set multiple curves there we go. Oh, ew. It's a little bit messy. Oh, and it's messy uh, for one reason. That's because of that point there that is being caught. Let me do this, and now it's it should be fine. Um, let's see. Mm-hmm. What the heck is that? Yeah, it's it's absolutely the same thing for you as well, Sarah. Um, you need a curve somewhere there. That region, that 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 green region that you have there, doesn't have a curve, right? For, that that would attract. So you need to either delete the region or create a curve, which, which would attract. And then it should work. So this will give you much more uh, free, uh, like a little bit more freedom to, to work with your shapes, I think. Um, because now you can kind of mess around with it. 
and find an, a, a, a nice, you know, an, a, a nice bend. And also it uh, removes uh, a lot of uh, stress from the shape itself. Um, I can show you uh, one, one, one little thing that you might find useful if you're planning on um, cre creating this shape out of flat panels later on. This is going to be a much harder thing to calibrate. Uh -huh. Wait, one more screen. Yeah, that happens because uh, look at it this way. This point finds the closest point here. This point, closest point here. This point, closest point here. And then you have this point here, which finds the closest point here. Your curve needs to, you, it, it, it has its limitations, how far you can stretch it, right? If you stretch it too far uh, away from the original control points, it's going to make these jumps. I can show it here. Uh, for instance, this, let me grab that control point, kind of move it like that. And well, that's a, a little bit too drastic. Let me move it back. Come on. There we go. Back, back, back. Okay, that's, that's good enough. See how uh, these points that are on the edge, they still can, uh, are able to find the closest points here. But the problem is that for this point, for instance, in the middle, the closest point is not the, the point on the arc somewhere there, but rather it is still here, right? So it will um, mess it up like that. Mm -hmm. um. Irregular in, in the sense of the height of it, or what? Uh, the more resolution you give it, the more uh, it's going to stretch. So let me show it this way. Um, wait, how do I show it? OK, let, let me create a new one. Um, OK, 10 minutes left. Let me create a new one. So I'll just make um, a patch here. Let's say looks like that. And then I will create another patch here. It looks like that. And I'll show you how to fix it. Yeah, that happens. Uh, well, it, 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 it's not that it happens, but it's, it's I think that just you know, it, it's a part of, 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 of kangaroo, how it acts. The more springs you have, basically the more it's, the stretchier it's going to be. So I'm just, I have those four patches here and it's going to, my mesh is going to look something like this, right? So you can see that this, since it's made out of three patches, it has much more resolution than this one that is made out of a single patch. Um, and then let me quickly draw uh, anchor regions like that, like that, like that, like that. Uh, come on. So I'll apply the anchor regions, set multiple curves. And for now, uh, just for this example, I'll disconnect the pull. Because uh, I don't care about that part here. See how much higher resolution mesh bends uh, with the same amount of force? 
uh, that's because it has more, think of these edges as springs, right? So it has more springs. So it, uh, the springs give it much more give. Uh, so so the, it can bend more. In case of this, uh, we have, I always try to do patches that are kind of uh, similar size. But if you have something like this, then all you need to do is, um, for instance, here, I would separate um, separate this rectangle and this rectangle into eight rectangles. So each rectangle becomes four. So I would separate it uh, separate it into eight rectangles, and that then it should solve uh, solve the trick and the trick the problem solve the problem. <laughs> um, there are a few things <clears throat> to be mindful of. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll, I'll finish the tutorial with this. <clears throat> got a dry mouth. Um, first one is if the patches are not connecting properly, if they're misaligned like this, whee, it's going to fly, fly away, right? Like that. Because you can see, if the patches are misaligned, the edges don't connect into a grid anymore. And if it's not a grid, it means it's it's disconnected. You know, it it, it won't work. So the patches need to align properly, like that, for it to work. Um, there was one more thing. Oh yeah, and if the patches are doing something funky like um, rotate uh, 3D. If you have, for instance, a non-manifold edge, right? So you have something like that. And then you have something like, like, like this, right? The, the shape itself is not going to work and it's going to break. So and every connection, every edge needs to, um, needs to have only two patches on each side of it. Three patches will not work. And the last thing is if I have something like this going on, uh, scale 1D, Yes. And let me lock the points here. If I have something like this going on, where I have three patches, right? Like so, one, two, three. And in this case, an edge is arriving not into uh, another Basically, in this case, uh, the, the corners don't match up, right? It's going to create this kind of a nice effect. Or even worse, it's just going to completely disconnect itself. Uh, yes, they can, but um, yeah, that's, that's a, a good question. Um, the way I would work with it would be, let's say I have this guy here, and let me quickly stop the simulation, reset. Right. Let's say I have this guy here. Uh, let me make a copy of him like this. <clears throat> and uh, for now, I won't use anchoring at all. Um, and let me scale him down to, 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 to something like this, right? So the way I would do it would be I would make something like, like this. Let me just quickly, I'm trying to, to fit it in into 40 minutes. So um, I'm, I'm going a bit faster. But this is just to, to explain the, 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 the concept. Okay, so, so first thing uh, for, for 3D, 
uh, first thing that I would do is I would create something like this, right? And if I were to reference all of these in, set multiple curves, this is how it looks like, right? Then I would copy it, right? So I have two of them. Set multiple curves. Or, or I mean, I can have it as, as like located like so that that's that's fine as well right and then i would create uh rectangles basically join join them up right so i would be ah come on too many snaps near off mid off center off and on perpendicular yeah there we go so i would be creating these kind of uh rectangles in between them. So immediately you can see that the resolution will mess up. But that's fine. Copy like that. So now I reference everything in here, set multiple curves. So this is my, my shape, right? Three dimensional. So it's basically like two, two layers on top of each other. I can make it a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit lower like that, right? So I have something like this going on. And then I want to anchor it down. So I will just um, create anchor regions and I'll just anchor it down to, oh. <laughs> We'll fix that, <laughs> like curve it down here and here. Oh, I should stop drawing in perspective. So the first thing is it's below the zero height, right? So I, I want to move it, move vertical to zero, right? If you type in M, enter V, enter, it will just move it in vertical direction. Ah, we couldn't fit it in 40 minutes. Okay, I'll call you again, um, just a second. Okay. We're back. Um, so to, for instance, let's say your shape is somewhere down, right? Um, somewhere away from the zero, zero, zero height. To, to move it back to your original zero height of the XY plane, you can select the whole shape, type in M, short for move, enter. Then you can see here, there's an option for vertical movement. So the shortcut for it is V, enter. Vertical equals yes. I click on the any point on, on my shape, like that. And you can see that now I can only move it in vertical direction. And then if I just type in zero and hit enter, it's, go it's going to be moved to the zero height, right? So I know that it's flat on the, on the ground. And then I can easily create my regions here and here, right? So these two regions for, for anchoring. Let me reference those in, set multiple like that. And notice how um, it's not just these points that are being locked but it's also these points. And that is because we are working with regions um, that, are, that are flat. You know, we're checking whether or not the point is inside of the curves at a given plane. And in this case, the plane is X, Y, which means that the checking happens in the top view and is just looking whether or not the points are inside of the region in the top view. If you, wanted to, if you want to be fancier, you are, are more selective. Well, actually, I'll show you that tomorrow. How to, instead of these kind of curve regions, how to use volumes. But the question was about the um, multiple layers or, or uh, using this to, to, um, to simulate a three-dimensional shape. And then if I just uh, reset and run it,
you can see a three-dimensional shape being simulated. And the longer, uh, like the, the bigger the resolution and the more, like right now I'm recording a Zoom meeting and also I'm converting a meeting, uh, the, the previous meeting and so on. So it's going to be a little bit slow, but by the end we get something like this. And here you can see um, some funky stuff going on which I'm not a fan of. So I think if I were to um, increase the smooth, increase the smoothing, oh, it's worse. Oh, it's so much worse. Oh God, no, no, make it stop. No, 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 back, 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 back. Okay, I, I, I will turn off the smoothing for, for this one. <laughs> so as you can see, smoothing can sometimes uh, screw you over. Um, either way, uh, we're left with uh, this kind of a form, right? Let me bake it out. As a default, move it to the side. And again, my front face is gray, my back face is blue. And if I look on the inside, that's my uh, front faces, those are my front faces, and uh, that's my back face. I think I messed it up somewhere here. Maybe not, I don't know. Anyway, um, I, if I don't like where uh, the front faces are looking, I can always flip to change it up. So that's double click, uh, not double click, but that's the command flip in Rhino. Um, and then I can offset it. So this is in millimeters. So before I uh, make it into a thick piece, I will uh, create a bounding box around it like that. And I will scale it, uh, scale. I will scale it between two points and I'll specify that that should be seven centimeters. 70 millimeters. Always scale before you give it thickness. And then I am going to offset mesh. Solid yes, delete and put meshes no. Uh, I mean also yes, <laughs> solid yes. Both sides no, delete and put meshes yes. And offset the distance, I will just choose 1.6 millimeters. Hit offset. This is how it's going to look like. Well, in your, on your screens, you will see something like this probably. Clean topology, clean everything. If I select it, type in what? Close double precision polygon mesh. Later on, uh, I will be showing you how to uh, do something like this with, with the shape. Um, right. Like that. You know, how to, how to make the shape smoother and nicer. But that is going to, like at this stage, you don't need this. At this stage, uh, this is much more than enough for you to <clears throat> understand what kind of a shape you want. And, and what kind of topology you want for the shape, uh, the, the, the shape to have. Uh, but later on, we will be looking into, you know, how to smooth out the, 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 the form even more. I think EMAP works on, on these shapes, doesn't it? Yes, it does. So as you can see from the EMAP, this is a perfectly, like both of these shapes are perfectly smooth without, like seamless without any problems. Love EMAP. Uh, well, for, for what reason? Is it, it, is it a nice picture or is it 
or are you actually using it to 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 analyze it <laughs> something <laughs> um anyway hope that uh hope that helps with uh, your 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 future not future R right now after we're done with the tutorial we should continue working on the shapes by wednesday evening you should have a second version of your form that is ready to print. Does the sturdiness from minimal uh, surface still apply uh, to the shape? Yes, it does. Yes, everything that has uh, close to zero mean curvature, meaning that uh, everything that doesn't change curvature really quickly, that doesn't have sharp corners and so on, uh, has the benefits of uh, minimal surface. So it's, it is strong. It is a strong shape. Uh, and Jakobsen, uh, is it possible to do something like this? Yes, it is. Literally, this example here is, is that only from, from the side. Wait, let me actually double check. Select objects. Uh, reference those in. That's good. Then where's my anchor region? Select objects. Or actually, I don't need that one. Reference those in, set multiple. Uh huh. And then footprint curves, select objects, set multiple curves. Is that like that? Uh, there was something in the chat. Oh, it displays the points vertically. Absolutely. You can, uh, how do I? Every point here, we move it. Yes, you can. Um, you can do it slightly here. Like if, if you just take the pulling curve and you pull it down, it's going to work. And unless you're pulling it too much. Hmm. Still works, wait. Let me pull it even more. Ah, there we go. Right. So so it the, the, the pulling curve can displace them, but you can also um you can also use more things. And also the pulling curve itself can be um can be displaced it doesn't make abs absolutely any sense to do this with the pulling curve but uh, just know that it can do that there we go um tomorrow i will show you how to have a little bit more e even more control over you know, how far do you move these, these connection points? Why is this? Oh, there we go. Sometimes you need to reset it for it to work. But, but yes, of course, of course, you, you, you can follow the, the, the landscape. Uh, making them snap to the site is a bad idea. Um, you can, you should kind of work with it visually and not you shouldn't automate that part that part ha uh, can have too many um breaking points uh so 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 it it, it can make too too many errors um if, if you'll try to automate it so it's much better to if you have a, a landscape that's you know mm -hmm. wait if you have a landscape that's doing something like that, right? 
Let me bring it back. Then it's much better to actually take the uh, control, uh, th th those kind of snapping curves, and actually move move them individually by 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 yourself by hand until your 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 structure meets the landscape. Also, this is very important. Note that the landscape will change and it's going to be changed by you. It, you always, when you build a building, you always dig out uh, the, 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 the ground and you put the building in and you kind of you know, shuffle the ground back in, in, in place. So the landscape is going to change. Um, so you should, shouldn't be too married to, to the landscape as it is right now. Uh, because you have the possibility to change it any way you want. Like the, um, what was it called? <laughs> oh, the loop? Yeah, the loop. Yes, uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, uh, because the loop doesn't have any kind of output stating that I am done, right? It's, it, it just goes and then it stops, but there is no, uh, no sort of a, couldn't you compare like when the count uh, on the loop is equal to the input input yeah count? technically 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 you can but then it's not the data then but rather then you use filter stream filter okay uh, which basically according to either true or false oh, uh, the, true. The, 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 the the stream filter either chooses this input or this input right okay so you can ask is it equal equal Equal, equal, equality, okay. So you can ask, is the count of the current generation equal to how many times you want it to repeat it, right? And by the end, the, the equality is going to be true, right? So let me connect this equality to the stream filter, uh, the, the, I don't know, gate, yeah, sure, gate input, like so. And you can see that now it's choosing from stream one here, right? So I can, instead of using the data dam, I can connect stream one like, like so. And the thing is that now if I click the reset button, yes, so, so it, it works. It works with the stream filter, right? So, uh, as it's counting, you know, as this value is not equal to to twenty, it will keep on um, g giving every everything else here stream from zero, which is empty, and as it reaches uh, whatever the number is twenty, as it reaches twenty, so as it's as it's at is as it is at its final step, um, it, it, it's going to let through the, the, the stream from, from one, right? From input one, which is all of the points here. Um, so you can't do that with the data dam, but you can do it with a filter, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, right. Actually, that's that's a good idea. Yeah, that's that's a good idea to uh, to, to to implement it that way. Um, so back to symmetry. So now uh, I I am using four uh, crosses, and it's all symmetric. But let's say I remove one of those four crosses, you can see that symmetry immediately completely breaks, right? Um, so, so you can kind of work with that. Uh, you can work with symmetry. Another thing is um, this whole part here is driven by a grid of points, right? The cocoon uh, meshing is driven by, let, let me hide the preview. It's driven by these points right here, which means what, what would happen if I just created a point at zero, 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 right? Just a single point. And I kind of referenced it in point, 
right click, set one point, you know, choose it. So what would happen if I added a point of, on my own, right? And holding down the shift key, I'll just uh, also plug in my, my manually added point to the one input here, just to see what happens, right? If I were to look at the cocoon, you can see that this whole leg received a, 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 a point here, right? So, so the, the mesh is stretching out. Let me remove the point so that you can see better. So if I remove the point, it looks like that. If I add a point, it looks like that, which means I can kind of move the point up and position it anywhere I want, right? The problem is that if, if I'm moving the point in an uncontrolled way, it sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. It's, it's a very finicky thing, right? Which means that there is a rule on how I can move the point. Um, and that rule is I always need to use the step of grid spacing, right? Wait, let me check. Zoom is going on. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Um, so I can, I can, I can uh, use grid spacing of 10 to move, uh, to move the point. So if I move it now by 10 up, it can be you know, here and perfectly works. And I can move it up by uh, 210, right? To somewhere here. No, I can't, it's, it's way too far. <laughs> Let me move it back. So uh, minus uh, 30, somewhere here then up by 10. So as long as I'm inside of, of those voxels, right? And as long as I'm moving by increments of 10, I can keep adding points, right? So for instance, let me make a copy by 10 to the side and another copy. So now I have uh, three points here, right? And let me reference those in. Set multiple points. So now I've, I've just made a bridge with these three points that I drew by myself. So um, you can add any amount of points that, that, that you want. Um, give me one, one, one second, I'll, I'll be right back. I, I just need to check up on one thing. And uh, in the meanwhile, practice and look at how, you know, what, what kind of variations you can do and what kind of variations you can't do. Um, just one minute. It's done. Resume recording. Okay. So, the, first of all, does it make sense with uh, adding the points? Uh, you know, how it all works. Let me know if, if, you, if you want me to break it down better um yeah why is it so important to like stay on the grid it seems that i i, I can understand that you need to have like a system of some kind but it seems to work like mostly even if you're a bit off the grid is it just that you need to have like um it, it kind works of... it, it, it work it mostly works that's because it self-corrects a little bit and that, that's why it, 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 it sometimes works. But uh, most of the time, I'm just trying to <laughs> create some sort of a weird thing here. Uh, most of the time, it, it, oh, there we go. It will not uh, work. Oh, sorry, I cut out. I think I lost my connection, but <laughs> uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so I, I couldn't hear you. <laughs> oh, you but couldn't you can hear take me? take it later, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, so most of the time it, um, it works or, or yeah most of the time it works that's bec uh, be because this guy uh cocoon uh it self corrects right the the reason why we're right on on the edges of the grid is because this whole space is voxelized right and cocoon works with voxel positions and the 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 key thing here is that we are using the same radius for for the point charge as our size or as our resolution, right? 
So we're at bare limit of um, how much it can fit. Uh, think of it this way. Um, you have a, a, a box, 10 by 10 by 10. You have a box, so that's a voxel, right? And, and we have uh, these kind of circles that are, are points on the corners of the boxes which are barely meeting, right? Simply because, like, like, like that, which are barely meeting, simply because uh, the size of the box and the size of the influence radius of the point charge is kind of uh, in, the same, um, in the same size, right? So they are barely meeting. And since they are barely meeting, uh, if you move one slightly away or slightly closer, it will start making mistakes. If it's slightly closer, it's still going to kind of solve it. But it's, if, it's, uh, if the points are slightly away from one another, then immediately a mesh that is going to be generated will not connect, right? Uh, it, there's going to be a break, uh, break point here. So, uh, and the reason why uh, we, we are not increasing the radius is because we want from, from Cocoon, let me show it here. What we want to get from Cocoon is this kind of a default uh, marching cubes. Uh, can I bake it? Is this kind of default marching cubes mesh, like so? which can be controlled at a much, much higher uh, rate, if that's a word, yeah, much higher rate, simply due to its simplicity. You can see, you know, that we are dealing with just a few triangles here and there, and it doesn't have like insane, um, a, insane amount of, of, of vertices or insane amount of points. So the, the thing is that this whole approach implements the fact that we are working in voxels and we are never, um, we are working in a voxel space and we're never extending beyond that voxel space. So our resolution as it is, is fixed. And since our resolution is fixed, it's, uh, it will start making mistakes if we go beyond, you know, if we, if we will start breaking the resolution. Think of it also this way. In Photoshop, in 2D, you have pixels, right? What happens if you want to put a point that is one pixel big, right? That, 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 a point that has a radius of one pixel, what would happen if you try to put that point in between two pixels? It's something bad, right? It, 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 so, it's so is the is the cell size? Is that when you tell uh, the cocoon what like what the voxel sizes they should have? Exactly. Okay. And so. if if the cell size here, like if if this uh, number ten, yeah. is is not the same as the grid spacing number here, for our game of life, right at the start, it's going to mess up. Let me so, it, so it has these corners and it only looks for points that are in these co those corners. Exactly, okay. exactly. So now I've changed the grid spacing to eight and you can see, you know, completely destroyed itself. Back to 10, now back to being good. So everything needs to match the corners of the voxels uh, for this method to, to work. But that gives you a lot of freedom. Uh, three minutes left. Uh, that gives you a lot of freedom. For instance, adding more points uh, and, and, and you know, introducing more points to the shape in a very controlled manner. Because the points that you introduce, if I were to bake this out, uh, da, 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 da. if I were to bake out this cocoon mesh and look at it, 
the points that I have introduced uh, in the top have exactly the same amount of influence as any other point in the structure. Meaning that uh, you cannot discern the points from the original point cloud, right? You, you cannot say what was added later on. Uh, that's a very important aspect. And also one more thing um, is the, 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 the one more thing for you to take care of is the smoothing. Um, so, so when we have a mesh that has a very low resolution such as this, and this is the lowest resolution voxel mesh that you can possibly have because the influence radius is the same as the voxel size. Since it has such a low resolution, catmull clark smoothing will uh, produce the, the most smoothed out results. Um, how do I explain this one? I still have a minute to explain. How do I explain it? Okay, uh, think of it this way. Um, if you have a box like that and another box here, and let me mesh this guy with a shit ton of polygons. That's not a shit ton of polygons. Detailed controls, minimum initial grid quads, uh, 500. Okay. What the, come on. Right. Mesh. Now I can't do minimum edge length, maximum edge length. Okay, maximum edge length is 10. Preview. Don't refine. No simple planes. This is so stupid. Oh, come on. Screw it. We'll, we'll do it live. Um, mesh box. Like that, like that, like that. Okay, that's good. And then here, <clears throat> 100, 100, 100. Okay, I have one like that. And then mesh box. One, one, one. Finally, okay. Um, so let's say we have a high density mesh and a low density mesh, right? <clears throat> we have two meshes. So let me plug those in, set one mesh. So I, now I'm gonna deal with the low density mesh and let's look at the Catmull Clark um, output of this mesh, right? This is how it kind of smooths out. Bake, default, okay. You know, th th this is how that, th th this box is being smoothed out. If I increase the level and then and, and kind of bake it out again, we're getting close to a sphere, right? And this is actually how to create a topologically very clean sphere, by the way. It's called a quad sphere. Doesn't matter, but uh, you, you, can get, you can do this. If I do the same thing, level one, if I do the same thing with this uh, high density mesh here, set one mesh, hide, and bake this out. If I do something like this with the high density mesh, then you can see only the corner has been smoothed out. Uh, Arctic. No, that's, that's a very bad idea, not Arctic. Better look at it here. So the reason for, there we go. 
So only the corner gets smoothed out, right? While here, with uh, the low resolution mesh, it becomes like a blob, right? So the reason for uh, us choosing to, uh, to do uh, lowest possible resolution voxel uh, structure or, or, or marching cubes structure is uh, to be able to implement the catmull clark subdivisions at, at their full potential, right? So everything gets smoothed out. Uh, wouldn't say perfectly, but close, close to being perfectly. And this is one of the reasons why it's a perfectly 3D printable mesh from the start. Right, it's 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 because we're running it through, uh, through cocoon with with this kind of a approach. Does does that make any sense whatsoever? Hello. <laughs> yes, I think so. <laughs> but sorry, I didn't follow. Where did you uh, control the the um, resolution of the cocoon? What which which the resolution of the cocoon. Oh, it, it's just standard that it's that it's as few um, mesh surfaces as possible. No, no, uh, you can't get less than this amount of uh, these um, uh, this amount of surfaces in cocoon because uh, the radius cannot be lower than the cell size, right? the radius of the point charge cannot be lower than the cell size. If the radius and the cell size is the same value, then it's going to be the same, um, sorry, then it's going to have the lowest possible polygon count uh, that it can, meaning it will be able to smooth out in the smoothest way possible. Can I do EMAP on this bad boy? Yeah, there we go. Let me turn off the mesh wires. So you can see it smooths out in a very, very clean, clean fashion. It still makes a, a few mistakes here and there uh, as it's smoothing out, right? But most of it is is very, uh, very clean, right? There, I don't know if you can tell this. Uh, is is it just me who sees if if things are breaking or not? Like by looking at the reflections. I think it's visible. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Because <laughs> I, 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 just me. <laughs> I, I I'm not sure if it's uh, you know, um, if it's the practice or or if it's just uh, yeah. I, I I guess it's it's very intuitive. You know, to see when where the reflections break and where they don't. But uh, so, so uh, according to the EMAP, you can see that it's very, very clean. Uh, that the reflections are very, very clean and it's only achievable, which means that the surface is very smooth, which is only achievable by um, you having the, 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 this kind of a radius set to be 10 and cell size also set to be 10. Um, that this kind of lowest polygon count possible and then smoothing them. If I had more, um, like let's say my radius is 20. Right? Then first of all, it would look like this. <laughs> right, just a pile of, uh, of things, I guess. So, so that, that would be the first problem, is that the points are too close to each other. But second of all, it, 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 would, uh, it wouldn't be as clean. And I, I think it's hard for me to, to show you wh why it's not clean right now with, you know, this just a blobby mess being here. But this is not as clean and also definitely not as interesting as, you know, as, as something like this. Um, tomorrow, I will be showing you how to um, carve and how to change the, 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 the structure of this. Meaning that today we learned how to add points by simply just, you know, referencing in the points and adding them to the list of, of points to, to, to mesh. 
Uh, tomorrow we'll be looking into how to change this form um, in, a, in a simple way uh, so that it's not inside of a box, right? Because up until now, everything here was inside of a box. Make sense? Or uh, also, since I need to run now, could you, if, if you have any, uh, like, uh, not individual questions, I don't know how to, how to say it, like is special questions? <laughs> Um, if you have any of those, uh, then, then just write me in Zoom and I'll, I'll, I'll try to incorporate those into these kind of a game of life um, tutorials for, for uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow. But the main thing is the overview of the tutorials is going to be that we today we learned how to add stuff. Tomorrow we'll learn how to carve, so how to remove stuff. And day after uh, tomorrow, we will learn how to um, change the change the behavior of growth. So change the behavior of these structures as they are getting taller. For instance, they get denser, or as they get taller, they get less dense. So that's going to be on Wednesday. Cool. Write cool in chat if it's cool. Very cool. Seems like everyone else. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Sarah, Olivia. <laughs> okay, uh, so keep, keep, keep playing around with it. Find the pattern that you like and try implementing more points into the pattern. And we'll continue uh, tomorrow.